Good morning, good morning, good morning to you. Today is um, Wednesday. You all know what I say about Wednesday. It's one of the more fun days of the week. Today's Amy's birthday, my wife. Today is her birthday, I think she's um, 22 years old. That's not true. Um, but apparently whenever a lady has a birthday, it's always a 22nd birthday. I don't know what the ideal birthday is for um, a man. Maybe 36, give or take? I don't know, what's the ideal age for a man? I don't know, I think, I think I'm actually, how old am I? I'm 35, I think. So if I'm 35 or 34 or something like that, we're almost there. Remember when I was young, I really wanted to be like 23. <laughs> I don't know why I wanted to be 23, because that's what a old man is. Well, now here we are. That's okay. Now we actually are an old man. All right. Um, so given today is a celebration day, we should talk about celebrating. Um, I've never been a big fan of celebrating in general. And I don't know why that is. I think that's because I try to generally be emotionally unattached to the, res to the results of anything, right? So if I don't care about the results, why would I be celebrating? And also, I realize that most things are either routine, and why should you celebrate a routine thing, or they are purely luck-based. And I definitely don't think you should get rewarded for being lucky. You should get rewarded for your skill, right? It's always so annoying whenever you, um, I remember in the past I would play video poker and that was the quickest way to get your diamond card. If you played, I think $25 a hand video poker, which was actually $125 to spend, you get your diamond card at the Harris casinos in like two hours and your expected loss would be like 500 bucks or something. And then you get to go to the, skip all the lines, you get to get free show tickets, you get free hotel rooms, you get uh, the, the diamond lounge, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, Whenever you're doing this in the process of playing, you will inevitably hit quads and good hands, right? Whenever you hit the quads, you get paid out, but they have to give you a tax form because I think when you get quads, I don't remember what the odds were, but it, it was enough. It was more than 3000 bucks, I think. So the, the casino person would come over and pay you out in cash because that's how they had to do it. And they would tell you, congratulations on your, your great spin. Like in reality, you're purely lucky, right? And... Especially in a game like video poker, it happens every few hours, so it's like not even a thing. But uh, people like to congratulate other people. And I always want to ask, what is the purpose of the congratulations? I sound very depressing right now, I know, because <laughs> it's my wife's birthday. Um, whenever you congratulate someone for their birthday, what are you saying? Congratulations on surviving another year? I mean, is that a reason to congratulate someone? Maybe it is. I don't know. What if they had a bad year? Congratulating on the fact that they got through a bad year? What if they had a good year? Are you congratulating them on the fact that um, they had a good year? I don't know, right? You're just, it's like a, you're just doing it because out of habit. And I try to not do things out of habit because, unless they're, they're very beneficial habits, because like, what is the purpose? That said, I realize a lot of people do love celebrating. Um, and I would ask, try to ask them, why are they celebrating and I think a lot of people need motivation and a lot of people need encouragement I'm very lucky in that I have never really needed much encouragement or much motivation I'm naturally motivated and I don't need someone telling me like, good luck or best wishes because I realize it doesn't matter right and um But I do think a lot of people need those things. So I do think celebrating is very, very good for most people, especially when they achieve something that is very difficult to achieve, right? Like, say you win a poker tournament. You need to celebrate a little, especially if you are very disciplined all the other times. Because in reality, you're not going to have that many big wins in poker, and it's perfectly fine to go out and celebrate. One thing a lot of poker players do, very incorrectly in my opinion, is they win a tournament for, let's say, $300,000. And then they go out and they party for a day. They spend $20,000 on their party. It's expensive. 
This is especially what you can do easily in Vegas. It's not hard to spend uh, twenty thousand dollars at a club if you have um, I don't know six or eight people with you, and if you have a whole entourage of forty or fifty people, then you're really going off. I remember one player a long time ago for a World Poker Tour final table. He flew in like fifty people and paid for all their flights and hotel rooms, and he said it cost him like a hundred thirty k, and a min cash at the final table was like a hundred k. This is a big final table, but uh, that's pretty aggressive, right? And brutal man a, a lot of people spend a lot of money on celebrating and it's fine if you need it but you have to, i think you want to ask yourself why do i need it and also could i do this in a manner that is less costly to my bankroll or net worth now if you have millions and millions of dollars then going out to the club and spending 20k once every three months probably isn't a big deal but a lot of people who do this excessive celebration are doing it purely for show and also, they're doing it at the detriment to their long-term selves, right? I mean, anytime you give away a large chunk of your bankroll for anything, if you lose it on investing or sports betting or at the casino or partying or giving it to charity or whatever, anytime you effectively lose a large chunk of your bankroll, there's a chance it hurts you well down the road. Um, I mean, just, just imagine you, you won 20% or 80% as much of what you would win each year, I mean, that's just detrimental. It's well known that if you don't have expenses, you move up way faster than if you do have expenses. And the uh, celebrations are effectively a form of an expense that some people uh, uh, incur and some people do not incur. So always ask yourself, what is the purpose? Callum says that's more showing off than celebrating. Well, it depends on, on how I view it, right? For example, whenever I won my tournaments, I won two, I won one, $1 million dollars two times. And both times, what was the celebration? One time I went out to dinner with my friends at Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. It was very good. They actually have two of them in Vegas, and uh, half of the group went to one, the other half went to the other by accident. And we eventually synced back up. It was funny. We were waiting around wondering where they went. Um, but that cost like a thousand bucks, and I want a million, right? It's probably pretty reasonable. Next, um, it was at Foxwoods when I won, and I didn't have any friends there, so I took. My parents out to the only restaurant that was open because the final table ended at 4 a.m. We went to, I don't even know, Fuddruckers? Is that a thing? There's some, like, dinery-type place at at um, Foxwoods that was open 24-7. So, I mean, that was a celebration. It cost, like, 50 bucks or something, right? Um, what I would do whenever I would win a tournament is I would buy real estate. Every time I've won a major tournament, one time when I took second for 750K, I bought some real estate for like, you know, 150K, 200K, 300K, give or take. And that money is essentially locked up. I know I'm not going to be selling it anytime soon. And that investment spends off some amount of income each year, right? Assume it um, spends off 5% a year. After 20 years, it's essentially paid for itself. Now, of course, there is inflation, so doesn't really pay for itself. But assuming the asset doesn't go up at all in terms of dollars, you still have it paid off roughly after 20 years. Now, 20 years is a long time. A lot of people want their investments to make them get rich quick immediately, but it's probably not a good strategy because those often will make you go broke um, because nothing is gonna 20X up immediately unless it has a very huge chance of failure. Now, of course, if you're diversified, maybe it's fine. Anyway, um, you want to make sure that your celebrations are not detrimental. That's really the gist of what I'm saying here. And it's easy to screw this up because I understand, especially if you have not had a lot of successes, you're going to really want to celebrate the fact that you have succeeded immensely. And the problem is, is that if imagine every time you have a 100 buy-in score throughout your career, you just give away 20 of them. You know, say you win a $10,000 tournament, a $10,000 and a $500 buy-in tournament. Is that right? Let's just pretend. Say you win $10,000 in a $500 tournament or a $200 tournament and you give away 2,000 of those dollars, well, your bankroll is now much smaller, right? It's going to make it harder for you to move up. Then imagine later you get a 100K score and you spend 20K of it on a party. Same thing. It's going to make it very, very difficult for you to ever move up long term. And I want to see you all succeed. How do taxes work when you win a final table? Um, they give you a, a 1099 and you, you pay your taxes. I use Teresa Fox. She is excellent. 
Saw my book Mastering Small Stakes in Eleven Hold'em. Read the first pages and bought it. Good. Hope it's enjoyable. Can't talk about what type of hands to defend three best with. Ones that have equity. We discussed this thoroughly over at PokerCoaching.com. You can get a completely free trial there. And uh, you have no reason not to do it. If you actually go to the oldest homework questions, it's this exact topic is discussed in one of the first three or four homework questions. So go check that out. If you're an amateur, can you include it in your regular income? I mean, I don't know. I'm not a tax professional. Um, if you're an amateur, as far as I know, you have gambling wins in one column and regular income in another column. You can write off all of your losses in that year, but you cannot write off expenses, as far as I know. Consult a professional. Teresa Fox is my accountant and has been for a very long time, and she is excellent. All right. What else? All right, so we talked about celebrating after a win. Next. What about excessive celebration at the table? This pops up every few years. Um, I remember Rain Khan, you all may not know him, Havad Khan, he excessively celebrated at the World Series of Poker. And I think the reason was to try to get on TV. I haven't talked to him about this, but he's normally a very chill guy. And he like was a celebrating like a ridiculous human, like taking the chair and putting it on his head and running around and acting goofy. And he got on ESPN. And maybe that was his ploy, right? He's a smart guy. I'm sure he could figure this out. Um, so is excessive celebration okay? First off, it's very hard to define what excessive celebration is. I mean, I used to get pissed whenever I was a young, dumb kid. If anyone celebrated in the least bit at the table, because for the same reasons, why would you celebrate for winning a poker hand? It doesn't make sense, right? Um, whenever someone does celebrate at the table, by the way, unless they're doing it as a ploy to try to get on ESPN, they're essentially telling you that they are emotionally invested. Now, being emotionally invested can be good or it can be bad. Um, actually, I don't think it can ever be good. It can either be neutral or it can be bad. Maybe like a tiny bit positive if it'll somehow make you focus better. But more often than not, when people are excessively celebrating, it labels them, as Natty says here, as a fish. So... If you're sitting there celebrating, and I realize this guy cares about winning a 10 big blind pot or a 100 big blind all in that's worth, I don't know, 10 buy-ins, you're playing way above your head. All right, good. Now we know this. And we can adjust to take advantage of that, right? If we know someone really cares about the money, they're probably not going to put their last chips in on a hero call. So if you know their range is very condensed, meaning it's a lot of medium string stuff, you can just bet, bet, jam, and they're going to fold a lot by the river. I mean, I saw this happen. I mean, I, I did it to a guy in Montreal where I took, I don't remember what place I took. That's how much I don't care. I don't know what place I took. I think it's like eighth or ninth or something. Um, this was like a few months ago where this guy seemed to care about the game very, very much. Probably got into a satellite. And so there was a spot where I just had to stone nut low and decided to run a bluff for <laughs> no real reason beyond my subconscious was telling me this guy's range is condensed. My range is not. And... We bet, 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 jam it, and he folded on the river, probably something like top pair. He got there on the river, thought for forever. It's like, man, I don't know if I can fold this. And it's like, yeah, I know you have top pair. <laughs> You're supposed to call, but he didn't because he cared about the money. If you can spot people like that when you know the range is condensed, you can just run them over. What's the best lower buying World Series of Poker event for this year for the money in terms of structure? I don't know. I don't care about structure so much. All the structures are roughly the same. I know they have that $500 tournament with no rake, so you should probably play that one if you care about a decent structure with no rake. When you cash in a big tournament, how much do you tip the dealer? I make sure the dealer gets tipped roughly 3%. Fortunately, most casinos take out 3% for you. Good morning, Kim. You just signed up for poker coaching for three years. For three years. Is it going to help this newbie? I sure hope it does. As Kevin says, if you use the lessons properly, you will definitely improve, and I completely agree. You're working from home for, to, for to, from today. I, gosh, I can't talk. It's your first time being here. I can't even put a sentence together. Well, sorry. Uh, you're working from home today. First time you're able to catch us live. Good. Glad you're here. Um, Natty also says, being emotionally high or low when celebrating or being sad can uh, keep you from noticing important tells or even paying attention to the game, etc., etc. Mark says that this tournament is the Big 50. $500 buying tournament, the Big 50 is a great one. I mean, you're probably not going to win a bracelet because it's going to have 20,000 people, but no rake, which is great, and probably at least an okay structure. A better structure 
than most uh, five hundred dollar buy-in tournaments. Did I plan this stream ahead of time, or am I just ranting about celebrating? <laughs> a little bit of both. Every day, I write down some notes. I don't know if you can see that. I write down some notes every day. Here's all the notes we have so far from a little coffee. So maybe, I don't know, 100 something. Whenever we get enough of these, I'm going to make a book out of them, whenever I have free time. The very first one. Oh, look. We, did, we had almost no notes on the first time. The very first episode of a little coffee. Pushing over raises plus callers. Plus a call plus callers. Make sure you show the math. Next. Travel tips. We've gotten a little bit more um, precise with our note-taking abilities because now we have a little bit of an outline. This is it. This is the magic. I wake up. I think, what's going on today? Oh, it's my wife's birthday. Let's celebrate. Oh, let's talk about celebration. There you go. Clint says, watch the YouTube video on how to use the range analyzer before you do the poker coaching homework. And I definitely agree with that. That will definitely make it easier for you. In the past, I talked about using blockers to three bets as a good option. Can I elaborate? Well, if you have ace x, king x, or queen x, it's less likely your opponent has ace king, ace queen, aces, kings, queens, etc., which means they're going to fold to your three bet a little bit more often than normal. Plan going to the World Series. You've been there five times, deciding what part of the World Series to go. Um, Mike, it, it depends on what your goals are, right? Depends on what games you want to play. So look at the schedule, figure out what you want to do, and go from there. A lot of people say they want to win a bracelet. If that's the case, play smaller field of events, right? If you want to play a lot of low buy events, I'm sure they're in the, well, I can tell you, they're probably in the middle to beginning of the series, because I know I'm not going to be there then. Um, if you want to have a chance to play the main event, well, obviously go then, et cetera, et cetera. Tournaments with anties versus big blind should be adjusted for. Um, really, there's not a big difference, unless you're very shallow stacked. If you're very shallow stacked, then yes, there's a difference. But ideally, you don't want to be very shallow stacked. All right, back to excessive celebration. Listen, people are allowed to celebrate. You actually want them celebrating because it makes it clear to you that they are not good. Or like more prone to be not good than the average player, okay? So don't be offended. Don't be emotionally distraught when someone is celebrating. And whenever you are a winner, you want to make sure that you are a good winner, right? You want to make sure that you are a gracious winner. You don't want to be a jerk. I mean, you'll see some people who are not necessarily excessive celebrators, but malicious celebrators. They say things like, yeah, screw you. You suck when they're raking your, in your money, right? So is that okay? That starts to be a little bit not okay. But again, you should not be offended by what people do to you. Because in reality, they are telling you a lot about themselves, and that will give you an immense amount of information. Like if someone's saying, ha ha, screw you, it means that they had some sort of grudge against you. And maybe they still do. And that's fantastic, right? The fact that they are trying to actively outplay you or trying to get you because they're going to be playing some horrible strategy if you just play fundamentally sound or just to take advantage of them, you're going to crush them. Amir says you just want a ticket to the $2,500 tournament. Satellite finished at 3 a.m., so now you're tired the next day. Any tips? Well, don't play the satellite that ends at 3 a.m. is the best suggestion. Ideally, buy it late if you can, but they probably don't let you. So finish the tournament, go to bed. That's it. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Finish the satellite, go to sleep, wake up at the last second. So celebrating could help your table image. Um, if people are good, most people actually don't care that much. I mean, listen, you have to understand that most professionals understand what the celebration means. Most recreational players, though, they just view celebration as normal. Um, they may not necessarily think much of it. But I'm trying to give you advice to help you know what to make of their actions, right? If Aces loses 20% of the time, doesn't that mean that at some point we shouldn't play it 20% of the time? No. You don't get to pick when you win or when you lose. And stepping up if you're properly bankrolled, should you do it? Probably. If you're beating, let's say, 1-2 and 2-5, start playing soft 5-10 games, right? If, you're, if you can play them in good times, like good hours, um, like let's say you know there are three bad players in the game and normally play 2-5, it's probably fine to hop in, right? Especially if you're already pretty much adequately bankrolled. 
Um, let's see. See, I'd be a good winner and a good loser. I'm, I'm a very big fan of not making sure my opponents realize that I care about this less than they do in terms of the money. And I will not be pressured by any sort of monetary situation. And um, you know, that strikes fear in a lot of people because at the end of the day, a lot of people do care. Um, whenever I have been heads up three times in my career for World Poker Tour titles, there's never been a chop offered, never a deal offered by any either player. And to be fair, every time I got heads up, it was against another good poker player, right? I, I was never against the recreational player. And we all probably presumed the other guy cared about the money more on both sides of the table. I know, I don't care at all. So uh, maybe other people don't care at all too, right? And anyway, if no deal is offered, or if a deal is proposed by one party and the other snap shoots it down, that's terrifying for a lot of people. And so you sit there and you play. And it says, when you show you don't care, it throws them off their game. It does, because a lot of people care very much so about large swings to their bankroll. If you're playing heads up for $500,000, I mean, that's a big swing to anyone's bankroll. And if I don't actually care that much, and you do, that's scary. You want to scare them. How do you adjust from cash to tournaments? Realize in tournaments you're playing all sorts of different stack sizes. If you look at the uh, quizzes or the homework challenges and the quizzes at pokercoaching.com, you will see that they are, there are various stack sizes. And that is on purpose because tournaments require you to learn to play all the various stack sizes. In general, though, you just don't want to go broke so often in tournaments, so you should be a little bit more cautious making thin value bets and, and big hero calls. It's funny because you hide your emotions when playing and you end up suppressing them when you win. I mean, Netter, I think that you have to ask, am I hiding emotions or am I just straight up not feeling them? Because I know, I just straight up don't feel them, right? So if I just straight up don't feel them, I'm not hiding them. And you'll find that if you start not feeling some emotions, because you understand math, you understand you're supposed to win sometimes, et cetera, et cetera, you just stop feeling them on, on both sides of the coin. What's my opinion on deep payout structures, but the very top heavy, I mean, I don't know, Predator, just adjust as you need to. Also, no tournaments are top heavy like they used to be. I mean, for example, the two WPTs I won, first was a million, second was 500, Third was 250, fourth was 125. So it went double, 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 double. Now it's like 125, 175, 250, 400, 650, or something like that. So structures are way, way, way more flat than they used to be. Hermano, listen, when you're thinking about poker in an incredibly incorrect way, you don't need to be thinking that I'm going to lose 20% of the time, therefore I should fold 20% of the time, because you don't know which 20% of the time you're going to lose. That's like saying I'm just going to randomly sit out one of these all-ins or I'm going to have 80% equity. Every time you get all-in as a favorite, you win money. Every time you get all-in as an underdog or play a pot as an underdog, you lose money. Do I ever see myself playing full-time again? I don't know. Give it some time. We'll see. What's full-time even mean? Am I going to be out traveling all the time? I mean, probably not because I have a wife, right? Maybe if, if my wife quits her job and wants to start traveling all the time, sure, but she likes being home, right? It's not all about me. It's not all about you. It's about everyone else in your life. All right. Excessive celebration. Don't be offended. Even if someone is a malicious celebrator, don't be offended. Um, realize that they are malicious celebrators because they have horrible things going on in their life and they're trying to help themselves overcome the fact that uh, their life is not good. All right, next, um, premature celebration. <laughs> this is when you celebrate ahead of time. Obviously, I think this is ridiculous because you shouldn't celebrate to begin with. But I think premature celebration is even more silly. I mean, for example, say you get it all over with aces against kings. Should you celebrate? And I think the answer is obviously no. Right? Why would you celebrate? Because again, just because you got it in good doesn't matter. So, what's the purpose? You see this all the time, like at the World Series of Poker main event final table. People will get it all in. The favorite with 57% equity will be like celebrating. And it's like, why? And then they lose, what, 43% of the time? 
He also says, that's when the poker gods strike you down, yeah. I actually remember one time, vividly, I was playing a heads-up tournament at Mirage. It's a long time ago, dates myself. I was heads-up against David Pham. I think we were down to four people out of 64 or something like that. And I got it all in, like, aces against sixes or something. And my friend behind me, who was watching, just started celebrating, fist-pumping, because he, he thought I won the tournament because I got it with aces against sixes. And then a, a six came, or whatever, whatever David Pham had. And I lost. And uh, <laughs> my friend felt like a jerk. And to be fair, maybe you should have. I don't know. But again, this is all irrelevant stuff, right? It's like whenever people slow roll you. It doesn't matter. Whenever someone spills a drink on you, it doesn't matter. When someone cusses you out, it doesn't matter. All these things just don't matter. And if you spend your time obsessing over them or taking part of them, you are likely going to be missing things or giving away information that is very relevant. Do we do the Mid-States Poker Tour drawing for the $1,000 seat to their main event? No, it has not happened yet. It's going to happen in three or four days. If you have not entered this contest, by the way, um, I don't know the URL for the contest, sorry. Look it up on Instagram or Twitter. We're giving away a $1,000 Mid-States Poker Tour tournament seat just because I like all of you and I guess I don't need $1,000 anymore. So someone's going to get it. Someone's going to win it. So far, we've given away, I think, three or four tournament buy-ins. One was for a Heartland Poker Tour event. One was for a Mid-States Poker Tour event. We gave away a package for the charity series of poker that included a bunch of rebuys, and then we gave out a few more people who um, got one buy-in, and everyone's had a lot of fun. So go there, enter. Someone's going to win. And um, if we give away enough $1,000 entries, eventually one of you is going to win. That's going to be a good story. may have to invest 500 k before that happens, but um, I'm willing to do it. Let's see. You've been following me since Jesus Ferguson spoke highly of me. That must have been many years ago. I've improved your game. Well, good. Thank you. You just watched my Pokerography episode. You can watch this at um, jonathanlittlepoker.com slash pokerography. P-O-K-E-R-O-G-R-A-P-H-Y, I think. Both you and Amy were tear-eyed in the end when she talked about how... Well, such a huge admiration for my amazing work. Well, thank you. I do my best. All you can do is work hard. Dragon, yeah, dra D David Pham is a beast, man. I don't know if he still is. I, I haven't seen him playing much recently. I see him at the World Series every year. I think he mostly hangs out in L.A. now. But, um, yes, he is rough. What were you feeling when I won the first million-dollar tournament? I looked emotionless. Uh, I was emotionless. I was actually annoyed because I got it in bad. I didn't want to get it in good. I wanted to get it in good, and I didn't. So I was annoyed at that. That's how I felt then. Obviously, that's a ridiculous way to feel. Do you have a PPP poker group you can join? Yeah, don't do that. Unless you don't like your money. Um, let's see. Celebrating early will also crush your mindset. Once the river takes you out, you get the old entitlement tilt. Yeah, maybe that's it. Is it? People celebrate ahead of time. They think, yes, I am supposed to win this. And uh, obviously, you're not supposed to win this. Am I going to go back to the pokerography haircut? We're getting there. I'm actually going to get my haircut today because it's getting a little bit long. Is there any other way to enter besides Twitter and Twitch? Pa uh, Patrick, you need to go and click on the URL. Go to Twitch. I'm sorry, twitter.com slash Jonathan Little. Scroll down. It'll be there somewhere. Um, or you can probably just search like at Jonathan Little and it'll come up because everyone is sharing this because they are all trying to win. Um, Jonathan, I said polarizing through mid range was best in almost all situations. Yes. But if you expect to get flatted, isn't a linear range better? Yes. If you expect to get flatted, you're probably using too small of a re-raise size, or your opponents are terrible, or you're out of position, right? Those are the times you need to use a more linear strategy. You played my home game back in 2015, and now you just found me here. Well, welcome. How am I doing nowadays? I'm doing great. How many World Series events am I playing this year? I don't know. Not a lot, though. World Series has done a great job of getting rid of most of the decently high buy-in No Limit Hold'em tournaments. <laughs> so, I'm not going to be out there for very long. I'm going to play at the beginning of the series. At the same time, they have the 10K World Poker Tour at Aria, and then a 15K World Poker Tour Tournament of Champions at Aria. Which is kind of annoying. The 15K overlaps with the 50K at the World Series, so you can't play both. Which is a bummer, because I wanted to play both. 
It's <coughs> poor scheduling by their part. <clears throat> so I'm going to play that, and then I think there's a 10K at the beginning of the series, and then a 5K. And after the 5K, I'm going to go home until I think the 23rd or something like that. Three or four days before the world, the main event. A few days before the main event, there's another 5K. I know you're good friends with David Peters. Any chance of getting a webinar with him? I have done my best, and uh, he's not interested. He does not talk strategy with anyone, as far as I can tell. I'm sure he has this close, very knit, a very, very close group of people, and uh, unfortunately, I'm not in it. None of my other friends are in it, so I don't know what the deal is. Probably just him and the Germans. What's the best advice to give all of you? Oh, it's my everlasting positivity. Funny enough, I used to be a very negative person. I know you all probably don't believe that, but I used to be incredibly negative. And I don't know what happened. A, a switch flipped to my brain where I realized you get to choose if you are happy or not. No matter your situation, you can find something good in it. If your situation is bad, you can look at that and view it as an opportunity, right? It's very exciting to have an opportunity ahead of you. And that's when things are going bad, right? When things are going great, you have even more opportunities and you have things to be thrilled about. What book am I most proud of? I don't know. It's a tough question. Every time I put out a book, I presume it, well, I guess I've done good work on it. I'm, I'm generally proud of it. I'm typically not that proud in general. I'm not a prideful person. I view most of my work as another project that is good, is going to provide a lot of value to people, and I don't need to dwell on it. I need to move on with my life. Speaking of celebrating, right? I remember whenever I got my first box of, um, my very first book, it came in the mail, it was a box of them I could give away and, or do whatever I wanted with. And someone asked like, what are you gonna do to celebrate? I'm like, celebrate, why? Because you got your book, it's published. I'm like, eh, start on the next one. <laughs> Let's see. How many tournaments can you fit in in a week at the World Series of Poker? Um, a lot. A whole lot. Two a day? Three a day? I don't know. If you do play two or three a day, you, uh, you're you not going to do so well. <laughs> it's actually funny. Whoever plays the most World Series of Poker events each year is always the biggest loser because that's the person who like never cashed and got to enter the most. Who was my first poker buddy? Dave Benefield. Raptor. How did I find him? I was on a poker forum. And we were like-minded, playing the same games, and we became friends. Do you ever fold King's preflop? I have an article on that on my blog. I don't know the URL. I'm sure you can search Jonathan Little Pocket King's preflop or fold or something like that. Basic answer is no. If you have to fold it, you probably played it poorly. Will I be getting Phil Galfond on my weekly Poker Hand podcast? I don't know. He hasn't gotten back to me. How bad do you want to win a World Series bracelet? Not very bad. If it snows, you have to clean the snow off your wife's car. You can be mad about the snow, or you can think about it, how your wife is going to feel nice someone did something for her. Yeah, exactly. Things like that. Have you heard of any soft 5-10 games in Vegas? Bellagio used to be incredibly soft. I don't know if it is anymore. Aria, incredibly soft. I played there last year. Super soft. So, um, there you go. Also, soft is relative, right? Like, if you are the fifth best player at the average poker table, well, probably not very many games are going to be soft. If you're the best or the second best player at the average poker table, most games are going to be soft. So it's all a matter of perception. Also, if you look around and everyone's just, like, a good kid, it's probably not a very good game. That happened at Bellagio last year. I kept trying to play 2550 or something like that. And the games were tough every time, so I just stopped playing. <laughs> stopped even trying, right? Because again, it was just me and a bunch of other kids. JonathanLittlePoker.com slash FoldKingsPreflop is the URL. There you go. Let's see. You'll grant that you can be needlessly, that you can be needlessly emotional. It can be a detriment, but taking pride in accomplishment doesn't seem like a bad thing. I'm not going to say it's a bad thing. I'm just saying it's how I operate, right? If you work hard and achieve something, celebration seems fine. Yeah. But again, I'm not saying it's bad. Mark, don't listen. I'm not saying celebrating is bad. I hope no one's taking that away from this. I've already said celebrating is perfectly fine and reasonable. You just don't want to do it to a detriment, right? 
lot of people do it to a detriment. And I'm saying just make sure you don't ruin your life potentially by celebrating too much or doing anything that gives away a lot of your money or a lot of your time. I know one guy who I'm guessing he had about a 500K net worth. He decided to make a donation to a charity for about $200,000. Really cared about it, really loved it. It was something that was very important to him. He gave away about 200K. Then he went on downswing and he went broke. If he had that extra 200K, maybe he wouldn't have gone broke, right? You have to be very, very smart when it comes to holding on to your money because it's really easy to lose it. And then, you know, once you do have that five or $10 million bankroll and you're spending off money left and right from all your other investments, that's when you can really start donating a lot, right? A lot of people think, I have to do this thing now. And you know, some things are timely, but most things are not timely and they can wait. And I think delayed gratification is vitally important if you want to succeed at most things. And people who want to do things now get themselves in a lot of trouble. Ryan says, you're enjoying my videos? Good, thank you. How long is a book writing process for me? Depends on how long the book is, right? Uh, let's see. I'll give some examples. This book, Try to Reading Small Stakes Poker Tournaments, very small book. Not a big book, right? This book took, I don't know, two days. So 80 pages in two days, give or take. This book, Mastering Small Stakes and Ellen Beholden, took about a month, about 500 pages, with lots of images that had to be quite precise, so it was very tedious. Um, most books take about, takes about a month of, of hard work. Most big books take about a month of hard work. And um, I don't know. I'm faster than most because I don't have to do a whole lot of research, right? A lot of people write books and they don't really know what they're talking about, or they have to make sure they do lots of notations. Like if you're writing a history book, you need to be notating your sources, right? It's a little bit different than a poker book where I already know what I'm talking about, right? Certainly there are some spots where I have to do study if I, if I don't know about it. I mean, when I wrote my first book, Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker, there were a few spots I was unsure of, so I had to do a decent amount of study to fix them. But even then, it was a relatively quick process because I write like I'm talking to my friends, like I'm talking to all of you right now, right? Think about this. If I took this, this, this right here, this is a chapter in a book, right? So if this is a chapter in a book, you see how I'm talking here, it took me 30 minutes, okay? I can write, I can write almost as fast as we're talking here. So that's gonna be about 30 minutes worth of writing to make a chapter. That's gonna, I mean, this would be like five pages long or something, right? So 30 minutes for five pages, how much is 500 pages? 3,000 minutes? How many hours is that, 60? 60 hours for 3,000 minutes? Then I have to go back and edit it, right? You go from there. So, I don't know, it takes about a month to write a good one. All right, went deep. 17th out of seven, 1,800 people. Good job. James. Ah, oh, James is taken out the trash. Bye, James. Um, am I, I'm a machine, yes. I mean, you have to understand, when I say working, I mean, I'm like sitting here grinding. I, I mean, last night, I'm actually in the process of something. I stayed up until 1 a.m. working on a project because I like it. I love it. I don't mind it. I know it needs to get done, I want to get it done, and I'm having fun doing it, right? So be aware of that. In regards to what the best book is, nothing compares to Excelling at No Limit Hold. It's by far the best book out there. Ooh, I, I agree, it's a very good one. Listen, I have to be very honest. Currently, my two best books are these two. Excelling at No Limit Hold, we did it with lots and lots of other world-class players. This was actually a fun project because we did webinars with a lot of them, and, um, Big book, right? Another very, very big book. This one I thought was going to be the fastest book ever because I thought, <laughs> actually, funny enough, Amy told me that I'm an idiot when I did this. Um, I thought, okay, everyone's going to turn in about a 25-page chapter. It takes me a day to write 25 pages. So it'll take them, let's say, a week each. I'm going to give them all the tasks at the same time so that I'll have all of the content in hand within a week. That's what I thought. You know how long it took? It took a year and a half to get all these people to get me 25 pages. A few of these people, I actually had to go to their home and sit with them while they wrote it. Because a lot of poker players have um, issues with procrastination, with desiring perfection. So this project, which I thought would literally take me 
a, mu- a week to get the content in hand. Took a week. It took a year and a half. And then I still had to edit it all because most poker players also can't write very well. So that took another. It's actually almost harder to edit than it is to write yourself. Because um, you have to change it into not your tone, but their tone, but well written, right? And um, this was a big project. Then we did the webinars. I thought we'd knock those out every two or three weeks. That ended up being a year and a half long process. It was a lot of work. You can see all the webinars, by the way, at Excelling at NoLimitHold'em.com or Hold'emBook.com, either one of those. This book, though, is a very great guide to how to play fundamentally sound No Limit Hold'em. This is more of a series of 25-page chapters on whatever each of these people are the best at. This is a complete guide to No Limit Hold'em, so different. It's a little bit different, but I like those. How do you purchase these books? Any links, please. Go to jlpoker.com slash books. jlpoker.com slash books is where you can find all those books. If you click those, I get a tiny little click back, or click back, a tiny little bit of a kickback from the sites. You've been an editor for seven years, and you're still convinced writing is just something people either can or can't do. Yeah, quite possibly. It's a hard thing to do, right? I found it just... It's like I'm talking to you, right? I'm trying to help you better your lives. I realize it's my duty as someone who has spent a lot of time bettering themselves and who has benefited a ton from other people's work. It's my duty to give back to people. And if I do not do that, I am not doing right, right? I mean, I want to do the right thing. And if I have information that can help people who care about bettering their lives, if I can help them better their lives, it's what I need to do. And that's why I do it, because I want to help all of you. Um, HL says there's a few misprints in mastering the printed version, the first edition. Yes, there are. There are three incorrect charts. You can find the updated charts at jonathanlittlepoker.com slash mastering edits in the middle of the page. There are three incorrect charts in the first edition of the printing. Sorry about that. They're right in the PDF I turned in. Something happened between when I turned in the book and when it got printed. Tough thing, because I had no control. Let's see. You get into poker so you can live your dreams by your own means. Yeah, for sure. You play a satellite for the main event, only one seat was available. Does that mean that you have to take very small plus EV spots as opposed to a normal tournament? Um, Yes, it's a cash game, right? If you're playing a satellite with only one seat... It's a winner-take-all tournament, which is very top-heavy. It's 100% top-heavy, right? And that means you're playing a cash game. So you should be taking like literally any decent edge that comes up, especially if you don't expect to have more edges in the future. I mean, you have to realize there's no benefit at all in moving up the payouts, right? Michael says you've been playing no hold for years. You joined poker coaching over the weekend, and you love it. Good. If you've not signed up for PokerCoaching.com, you can get a completely free trial for a week. Go to PokerCoaching.com and sign up. No credit card is required. You do have to have an email address. That's all you need. What books helped me in the beginning? I started off playing Limit Hold'em, so I'm not even going to waste your time giving you the books. No book helped me at No Limit Hold'em, which is why I wrote the book. Um, I realized that uh, Harrington on Hold'em was way, way, way too nitty. And if you just played loose and aggressive, you'd crush everyone who was following that book, which is why me and a lot of other kids want so much money back in the day because someone put out a book that taught a, like, you know, fine strategy. It's going to teach you to be a small winner or a small loser. But um, fortunately, that strategy was full of holes, and all you had to do was just be overly aggressive, and you'd crush your opponents. Are we going to do the morning coffees during the World Series of Poker? These shows? Mm, I don't know. I don't know. Probably not at 9 a.m. Eastern time. We have to change the time. The Float the Turn app is great, too. Yeah, we're going to be doing some updates to that in the near future. That's exciting. We're actually doing a lot of updates. We're, we're hiring new coaches for PokerCoaching.com. Not, not just new, additional coaches to PokerCoaching.com. And we are changing the site a little bit to add an even additional value. Anyway, we're doing lots and lots of work. If we somehow get ramped up to the maximum that, that I will have us doing... Over the next few months, it'll be like 10 live webinars a month. It's actually too many. <laughs> 10 live webinars and uh, how many quizzes? 40 quizzes each month, so more than one a day. 
It's a lot. That's a lot. I don't know. I may, may be putting up too much content. I don't know. I, I actually sent out um, feelers to like five or six coaches to see if they'd be interested in doing two webinars a month, eight quizzes a month, and a few articles a month. And they basically all said yes. I didn't think they'd all say yes, but they all said yes. So it's a problem. <laughs> now I have too much content. And I'm probably going to end up spending all the profits. That's okay. What's a typical day for me? I wake up, take care of the babies, do a little bit of work, take care of the babies, take care of my wife, do a little bit of work, have dinner, go to bed. Can I say who's on board yet? No. Definitely keeping Matt Affleck and Alice Fitzgerald on, though, and they'll start doing webinars for us in the very near future. Matt Affleck is already scheduled for March 18th, his first one. And um, we'll go go from there. Let's see, what else do we need to talk about? Celebrating. Say I sign a new coach to PokerCoaching.com. Does that, uh, does that validate, or does that require celebration? Say I get a new subscriber to PokerCoaching.com. Should I go sign up? Should I go celebrate for that? Say I have my biggest month ever on PokerCoaching.com. Should I be celebrating that? Um... The answer to all these questions, in my opinion, or no, because I'm always looking towards the bigger picture. I'm always striving to do better, and I'm not going to get bogged down by thinking I've done it. If you look at the poker community, a lot of people get to the top, and as soon as they start thinking they are the best, that's when they start celebrating. That's when they start being a little bit lax, and that's when they start falling off the map. And you have to make sure you don't do that, I mean, I've essentially done that in poker, right? I stopped being the best a long time ago. I'm still pretty good, don't get me wrong, but I'm certainly not in the top 10 poker players in the world, and to be fair, maybe I never was. But um, I'm not going to do that in business. I've realized that if I have dropped the ball in poker, that is okay because I'm still quite good and I study from the best people in the world. And um, we're not going to drop the ball in business. I know that much. I don't throw a party when I get a new poach, a new coach. No, we don't. What do you think of Alice Cheryl's large openings and super wide three betting ranges? I think both are very good exploitatable strategies. Alex Cheryl put this really well, actually, in one of his webinars. He said, Jonathan Little is really good at teaching you to beat good, competent players, whereas I'm really good at teaching you to beat people who play very poorly. <laughs> and it's true. Um, I'm certainly not the best exploitative player in the world. Um, I, I mean, I try to make adjustments to the best of my ability, but at the same time, I'm not playing in like $200 buy-in tournaments on a regular basis. I'm playing the very high stakes, right? And it does take a slightly different strategy, so be aware of that. Do you play on America's card room? No. I do not play on any of the unlicensed sites. Oh, let's see. Every day your hit, fit, feet hit the floor is a reason to celebrate. Uh, yeah. So what do you do? Do you go spend 20K a day on going to, by going to the club to celebrate? Or do you have gratitude and then move forward doing productive things, right? People go overboard with celebration. That was the main point of this. Correct player, two from the money. You have six, 17 big blinds. Player limps from under the gun with 10K. With 155K, you have ace, king of hearts. You shove. It's probably fine. If they're a very tight strategy, or if they have a very tight strategy, then it's probably better to limp behind. But shoving's almost certainly good. Yeah, Greg says, celebrate and then go for your next goal. Yeah, the question is, how much do you celebrate? I, maybe all of you are coming here late and you've missed the first 30 minutes of this where we discuss that there's nothing wrong with celebrating. You just don't want to do it to a detriment. And a lot of poker players are world-class celebrators. They are good at going off and spending tons and tons of money for fun. You never think you're better than anyone. You're always competing against yourself. Is this good? I generally have the same mindset. Um, I just try to not get worked up in this, right? My goal is to be the best I can, and that's it. I'm, not, I'm trying to not, well, I know I don't try to get involved with like leveling wars or being envious. A lot of people have problems with envy, like horrible problems with envy. They see someone winning a tournament, and they think, oh my God, I, I need to be like them. And then they see someone else, and they think the same thing. And next thing you know, they're feeling awful about themselves. But you have to realize, in the world of social media, you only see the best of people I mean, sometimes you see the absolute worst. But for the most part, you see the highlights, right? And looking at someone's one-minute-long highlight reel each day is not 
indicative of their life at all. Like, at all. So um, do not think it is. <sighs> Let's see. I have to go now. I have a meeting in eight minutes. It's going to be fun. may have something nice to announce on Friday. Well, nice for me. It may not be nice for you all. Maybe I'm seeing a charity tournament in the near future, which will be my first time doing that. That's a little bit nerve-wracking. Should I celebrate? <laughs> Definitely not celebrate until we're done with that one, because that's going to be nerve-wracking. If I became a professional poker player today, what would I start? How, or how much would I need to start? Listen, I started with $50, and that's all you really need. Be very disciplined. Have lots and lots of patience. Grind as much as you can. And study as much as you can. Really, you don't need any money, because you can play free rolls. I would not say to play free rolls, because I think that's a very, very bad, poor investment of your time. And you're playing as people who don't really care. You would much rather play for real money, so 10 bucks, 50 bucks, something like that. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday. That's very accurate, Mark. You don't think the average player, average viewer, or even a poker player, would get how someone could win a million dollars and just sit there if it happened. <laughs> yeah, most people don't get it. And that's why we succeed, right? I'm not trying to appeal to the average TV viewer. Maybe I should have done that more because they all think I'm a robot. Maybe this is me trying to appeal to the average viewer a little bit more. Like, oh, no, I'm not actually a robot. Maybe I'm a little bit, but not such a robot. But yeah, um, you always have to ask, who am I trying to appease? And if the answer is only you, then it'll be you. Oh, hi, we have a special guest. It's Mr. Thomas and Amy. Do you want to be on the camera today on your birthday? Amy says, absolutely not. Amy's hair looks like she's been sleeping for 18 days and hasn't showered at all. Here's Mr. Thomas. I'm going to say, oh, you're such a big boy now. Mr. Thomas, stand. Can you stand up? Look, he's standing. He's literally standing. He's so big. Oh, you're, sh you're such a sweet man. He's a sweet, sweet man. He's been sleeping through the night. He um, he slept, what, four nights in a row? Yeah, from like nine to five. Four nights in a row from nine to five. Nine to five is eight hours. That means Amy's getting at least eight hours of sleep each night now. Oh, no, no, that's not right. That's not right. That's not how that works. Everyone's saying happy birthday to Amy. Everyone is? So that's good. Thank you all for the birthday celebrations. Thank you. She, she does exist, but um, she's camera shy sometimes. Maybe we can get her on in a few days. Maybe on Friday. We talked about celebrating today. I said it's okay to celebrate a little bit, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. You think that's wise? She says yes. All right. Have a great day. I have my, my call in just a second. Good luck. Have fun. Be nice to someone. If you celebrate, celebrate a little bit. Make sure you enjoy your life and make the most of it. I'll talk to you on Friday, 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Also, if you enjoy this stream, click like, click subscribe, and um, tell your friends. Talk to you later. Oops, I clicked the wrong button. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We have not ended yet.